five. So years ago, I wrote about Nicola Sturgeon and I said she was like a cross between a Shetland pony and a Bay City roller. Four. It seems as if her determination to have her own way on certain gender identity issues has done her in politically. Unless your parents win the lottery, you're not going to move into a better casual area during your entire education. Don't you think those alien UFO balloons are coming in, taking one look at planet Earth and deciding that it's, it's too mental? One. We have left off. Welcome once again to Planet Normal, a Telegraph podcast with Alison Pearson. Hello. And me, Liam Halligan. The Prime Minister's confirmed that RAF fighter jets are on standby, Alison, should any of those Chinese weather balloons happen to float over Britain. Meanwhile, the Home Office and related security bodies are warning that British police forces are, quotes, shot through with Chinese-made CCTV cameras, drones and other surveillance equipment, which could be doubling up as spyware. But surely, co-pilot, the most alarming development in Sino-Western relations over the last week, the one that really concerns the White House, is that the Chinese social media app TikTok, which scours your phone for personal information, has censored Planet Normal. That's right, TikTok temporarily blocked our discussion last week with The Telegraph's excellent science editor, Sarah Napton, about what she described as an observational link between heart problems and some mRNA anti-COVID jabs. Who knew we had such powerful <laughs> listeners in Beijing? There's a lot of news about Alison. The Tories are at war over tax ahead of the 15th March budget. You've written powerful columns in Wednesday's Telegraph on both the notorious Gender Identity Development Service at London's Tavistock Clinic and about people of good sense being unfairly labelled far right. And just now, as we settle down to record Planet Normal, news has broken that SNP leader and Scottish First Minister Nicola Sturgeon has resigned. We'll come to that, Alison, but first, what do you make of TikTok censoring a perfectly reasonable discussion between the two of us and the superb Sarah Napton? It's quite astonishing, isn't it? Actually, just before we go into this outrageous censoring by Beijing of Planet Normal, I have to say, I don't think those alien UFO balloons are coming in, taking one look at planet Earth and <laughs> deciding that it's too mental. We predicted we were going to go back to the 70s, didn't we? A year and a half. I mean, the Brady Bunch reruns, flares are coming back. I didn't think we'd get UFOs as well. <laughs> no, I know. Yes, just to say that listeners will have heard what I thought was an eminently reasonable, quite calm discussion with the brilliant Sarah Napton uh, last week, touching on vaccine injury and just possibly now looking, Liam, at the sort of age-related benefits and risks, which I think is a conversation we need to have. And I think it was a conversation that you and I felt was good to have because apart from anything else, it discourages the wildest shores of conspiracy theories, doesn't it? But Adam Brooks, one of our former Planet Normal guest, the publican. Adam liked the Sarah Napton interview very much, thought it was great. And then he posted it on his social media. He put it on TikTok and it was taken down as violating their community guidelines. Can I just remind Planet Normal listeners that this is the TikTok which has absolutely appalling self-harm material amongst other horrors. So I think it was a bloody cheek to take down Planet Normal. But it does still show, Liam, doesn't it, that there are sensitivities in certain quarters. We shouldn't harp on about this, but I did think that last week was a really useful episode of Planet Normal. You and I wanted to discuss, didn't we, links that were emerging, still unproven, but observational yeah. links, as Sarah so brilliantly put it. Yeah. We wanted to discuss them on the podcast. We wanted to discuss them with somebody who we knew was absolutely across the issue and an expert in her respective field. So we invited Sarah on and we were really pleased with the results. And it just seems so odd. We weren't really saying anything that even parts of the government haven't acknowledged are of concern, links between heart conditions and the mRNA vaccines. This is not particularly contentious or way out there at all. This is mainstream scientific discussion, albeit by us, with our science editor, in order to try and decipher these very difficult parts of the news. And it struck me, you know, if Beijing were going to ban us over anything, I thought... <laughs> <laughs> picked another hill to die on. But look, talking of hills to die on, crikey, eh? Politics. Nicola Sturgeon. I know. It seems as if her 
determination to have her own way in the Scottish Parliament on certain gender identity issues has done her in politically. Now, I've got to tread quite carefully here. This will make you laugh. So years ago, I wrote about Nicola Sturgeon and I said she was like a cross between a Shetland pony and a Bay City roller, (laughs) a comparison by which I still stand. But I had the monstrous tartan hordes descending on me because they don't have some of the Sturgeon SNP supporters, and they don't have a great sense of humour. Anyway, my favourite comment of the week so far comes from one of our Scottish listeners (laughs) who, responding to the Sturgeon resignation, said, oh, she'll be back in a few months as Nicola Sturgeon. (laughs) We always said it was strange, didn't we, that she was so adamant that she was right. Mm. The real flashpoint, wasn't it, was the decision by the Scottish government to allow a male-born person who'd raped two women and who hadn't had gender-changing surgery. So he was or she was allowed into a female prison, clearly a threat to female-born inmates of the prison. Yes. And yet she decided, and let's be clear, Labour and the Lib Dems also voted with her, with the SNP in the Scottish Parliament, to put forward certain gender-related identity issues, which Alistair Jack, the Scottish Secretary, reversed. And you got polling out, over the last couple of days, which shows that most Scottish people agreed with that decision, even though it was a decision made by a Conservative government. But with so many you know, traditional church-going people supporting the SNP, it seemed really strange that she decided to make the constitutional point based around this particular issue, which itself is so contentious. Yeah, I mean, I think obviously the gender recognition stuff, this double rapist, Adam Graham, who decided that he was a trans woman called Isla Bryson. And we had the absolute final absurdity of trans ideology with the First Minister unable to say whether this double rapist was a male, female or indeed anything else. And I tell you what's really interesting is that I don't agree with Sturgeon on a lot of things, but she always had a great popular touch. She was an incredibly canny political operator. I think you could argue one of the best in these islands since Tony Blair. I agree. A formidable election winning machine. If you remember that she was first minister for eight years before that as Alex Salmon's deputy and the SNP was transformed from being a pretty so-so opposition party to the dominant force in Scottish politics. And of course, over her tenure, Sturgeon led the SNP to repeat election victories at UK, Scottish and at local level. But her huge failure, Liam, I think, and and everyone has a sort of tragic flaw at her kind of level, was this inability to develop her key political mission, which was independence for Scotland. And I think, you know, ultimately she was absolutely blinded by this obsession. She badly neglected domestic issues or kicked them down the track until Scotland was independent, everything else could wait. And and honestly, the stats are nearly all absolutely atrocious. Life expectancy in Scotland for men and women has gone down quite badly under Nicola Sturgeon. Drug-related deaths absolutely stored under Sturgeon. Scottish NHS is really bad. The only thing that she has done, which is better than England and Wales, is that Scotland's poorest people are now better off than England's poorest people. But guess what? She paid for that with the Barnet formula money from the English that she hated so much. And I think what we saw in the last few weeks was that she was running out of road politically on independence. Her plan had been to treat the next general election as a de facto independence referendum. Now, you'll remember, Liam, that our Supreme Court found that had ruled that Holyrood could not hold a unilateral referendum. So she was going to use the next general election as a de facto poll, as it were, on independence. But this was not supported even among people who voted for the SNP at the last general election. People vote for lots of things in an election, don't they? How can we assume that everyone voting green is pro-independence? It just doesn't seem to make any sense. She's also basically fallen heavily in the opinion polls. I mean, Labour are no longer a joke in Scotland. Quietly, in a very effective way, Anas Sawa, who's been Labour leader since 
2020-2021, he has built Labour's polling in Scotland from less than 20% now to consistently above 30%. That's a major, major change. Under Since mid-2020, the SNP support in Scotland has gone from decisively over 50% to nearer 40%. And support for independence itself has also fallen to roughly 40%. And it seems to me that Sturgeon's one-trick pony act of just saying everything is a kick in the teeth for Scotland, everything is a constitutional outrage, everything is a betrayal of Scottish voters, when, as you say, the outcomes in terms of health and education have been so poor, I think a lot of the Scottish people are becoming impatient with that. The irony is, of course, because she hates the bloody Conservatives, doesn't she? But she did do the Conservatives a huge favour, of course, because she managed to shut Labour out of Scotland overwhelmingly. And I suspect that one of the bigger beneficiaries of Sturgeon's departure is likely to be Keir Starmer, possibly not in the short term because the SNP is still pretty far ahead in the polls. But in the medium term, and uh, some of our Planet Normal listeners in Scotland have said nationalism is over for a generation. So I think she is bowing out now, partly because obviously the gender recognition stuff made her look absolutely ludicrous, a bit of a laughing stock, but also because her grand project is now pretty doomed. Just thinking about the Keir Starmer, Liam, I think that what's been overshadowed by the news of Sturgeon's resignation is the fact that Starmer was saying yesterday, Jeremy Corbyn will not stand as a Labour candidate at the next election. The Equalities Commission has just taken Labour out of special measures for anti-Semitism, which it was put in in October 2020. 20, largely due to the dreadful Corbynist anti-Semitism. So you've got Sakir now, haven't you, nailing momentum to the ground, as it were, and plus this opportunity now to win back a few Labour seats in Scotland. So this is looking like a good week for Labour. It certainly is. And before we move on, while we're just talking about constitutional issues in Scotland, it's never ceased to amaze me that when you look at the results of a general election. Let's just put the Scottish elections to one side at the moment, important as they are, because, of course, Scottish MPs have just as much power pretty much at Westminster as MPs elected in England. She keeps saying how underrepresented Scotland is. It's massively overrepresented. Before we move on, can we make this point? So really, when I absolutely came to despise Nicola Sturgeon, was she cynically used the COVID pandemic to advance the cause of Scottish independence yep. using the separate powers she had under devolution to accentuate the difference with England rather than pulling together as one united nation and at a time of national emergency. And listeners will remember that Scotland's lockdowns were sometimes contrarily longer. The mask wearing was more extreme, even though it had less than any benefit in Scotland at all. And in Matt Hancock's book, he admitted that the Westminster government capitulated and agreed to kids in English schools wearing masks purely because Sturgeon had imposed that on Scottish children. So there she was, ramping up the grievance machine to blame Westminster for all of Scotland's ills. I think goodbye and good riddance, frankly. I agree. That was absolutely part of the COVID theatre, which David Frost labelled so effectively. But look, you've written two barnstorming columns <laughs> this week. The first one was about the Tavistock because you read a fantastic book. We've spoken before, haven't we, with James S's and others on Planet Normal about GIDS, the Gender Identity Development Service for Children and Young People at London's Tavistock and Portman NHS Trust. Now, we have known, Liam, haven't we, that deeply dodgy things were going on at GIDS for quite some time. There was an interim report last year by Dr. Hilary Cass mm. finding the Tavistock model of care for confused adolescents wasn't safe, huge increase in gender distressed youngsters. And rather than acting as a pause button, wasn't allowing them to explore their identity rather than to lock them into an extreme medicalized treatment pathway, which, if you please, had no evidence about long-term effects. Anyway, yes, now comes this 
bombshell of a book from Hannah Barnes, a Newsnight journalist. The book's called Time to Think, the inside story of the collapse of the Tavistock's gender service for children. And Liam, it is about as bad as you could possibly imagine. It is totally jaw-dropping. This is supposed to be a reputable NHS highly rated clinical institution, take your pick, incredibly complex children put on medication after just one face-to-face meeting. More than a third of the young people referred to GIDS had moderate to severe autistic traits compared with fewer than 2% in the general population. And this is one of the most damning things really, is that referring more than a thousand under 16s for puberty blockers, any concerns raised by clinicians were ignored. To keep a gold dust NHS contract, by 2021, the GIDS clinic accounted for almost 30% of the Tavistock's income and no one wanted to strangle the golden goose, Liam. What did it matter if a few hundred kids had their whole lives and genitals and breasts removed? And it's been compared to the drugging and doping of East German athletes in the 60s and 70s, although that did involve guinea pigs who were already adults. These are mainly children. It's really horrifying. I must say, I thought it was a powerful column. Listeners can get the link in the show notes to this episode, particularly the follow through, if you like. If you go onto puberty blockers, you're almost certain at the Tavistock, or you were before it was closed down, to go on to much, much stronger, much stronger completely yeah. irreversible treatments at such a young age. And of course, always. Looming large over these discussions is the case of Kira Bell. You interviewed her, Liam, didn't you? Indeed, who had a double mastectomy and then later in life, though still when she was very young, decided that had been a mistake. And Hannah Barnes raises, and you raise in your column, the possibility now of serious damages from the NHS being paid potentially to previous patients at the Tavistock. Well, I think it could be... A few billion quid, to be honest, couldn't it? They say they've got no idea how many of the children they treated have gone away and and had second thoughts. So it's absolutely mind-boggling. And I think that, I mean, I'm maybe hopeful, could this be a sea change now? We've had charities, so-called charities like Mermaids and Stonewall. They've taken a vast amount of public money, Liam, to aggressively promote trans ideology through school. across the public across sector across the as well. public sector what is it about the civil service that they have to spend so much of other people's money on consultations with these charities in order to get their seal of approval their imprimatur i mean how has this happened well i don't know but it seems that whatever department you are if you get one of these stonewall awards then you can big yourself up as being pro lbgt but of course i said in the column i argued in the column i don't think the t of lbgt doesn't belong with lbg does it it's a completely different condition and in fact one of the things that comes through from hannah barnes's book is that actually children presenting at the clinic who may well just have been gay their parents preferred them to be trans. So lots of actual gay members of staff were saying, hang on, isn't this a kind of conversion therapy against gay kids? It's absolutely mind-blowing. I'm just wondering whether the tide will turn. I don't know. What do you think? The combination of what's been going on at the Tavistock, Nicola Sturgeon's political fate, certain sporting bodies now taking a stand when it comes to female sport, listening to people like... Sharon Davis, like Martina Navratilova and others, world-class sportswomen who are worried that female sport will be completely destroyed by this. I think now it seems like part of the firmament, if you like, that doesn't want to listen are the big corporations, the big businesses who seem determined to follow so-called woke capitalism. Look, we should say you were very careful to distinguish between some of the advice that was given at the Tavistock that was inappropriate, but also the need to treat very carefully and with respect genuine gender dysphoria, which is, of course, a recognised medical condition. And no one would want to belittle the trauma that that causes. And I think that is an important distinction. I think it's just 
much, much more of a minority thing. And I think that I've mentioned before, I have a trans friend and she's certainly spoken to me about how the politicization, the weaponization mm. of her condition has led to a much more alarming and uncomfortable state, far from making things better for trans people. They're actually sort of stirring up I think, animosity. But I think that these vast numbers of children, the increase particularly in teenage girls coming forward for this stuff, I mean, it's just dystopian, Liam, isn't it? It's absolutely horrendous, really. i tell you what has changed. I think that a lot of centrists, progressive, highly educated women now are speaking out about this, whereas previously they'd have buttoned their lip and just been polite at dinner parties. Because to write the kind of column that you've written until very recently would have been to have presented yourself as a bad person in the eyes of lots of other people. But I do think that the consensus now is shifting. I do think that columnists, commentators, far less courageous than you, Alison, if I may say so, who are much, much more concerned about upsetting people, they are now starting to speak out. We've seen the case of Hadley Freeman, a very highly respected Guardian columnist of many, many years standing, and she basically left the Guardian because they wouldn't let her write about this stuff, and now she's plying her trade at the Times. And it strikes me that when people like her, people of impeccable kind of metropolitan progressive credentials, are now seen to be on the side of what I would call basic common sense in this debate, then the debate will shift quite quickly. That tallies quite well, actually, with what I wrote in my other piece and my column this week, which was about the way that perfectly sensible, legitimate views shared by millions of people are increasingly damned as far right. Have you noticed this, Liam? I mean, we can't claim that the government's right wing at all. So it seems to me that the scale has shifted somewhat to hold what I would think of as I would see myself as being fairly socially liberal, fiscally conservative. But now many of my views, which I know are shared by lots of Planet Normal listeners, as as well as millions of people in the country, this is now far right to raise questions about the good sense of allowing thousands and thousands of migrants, undocumented young male migrants, to be put up in hotels around the country. And get this, we had a piece in the Telegraph yesterday, that's Wednesday, which was basically confirming all my suspicions, which is that the vast majority of these people are put in the North and the Midlands, Liam. They're not put in Hampstead or Richmond, which is full of all the sort of theers and Leonoras who actually want these people coming in. They're actually put in the areas where the majority of people think, we hang on, we've got stretch for local services, we don't want them. And the killer stat of the week for me, listen to this, the Home Office has forecast that the hotel bill for migrants this year will rise to £2.8 billion. That's real money. This reminds me of uh, the young ones You had Rick, played by Rick Mail, of course, and you'd have Mike, the cool person, say something like, oh, Rick, can you lend me 50p because I want to go down to the shops and buy a bag of chips? And Rick would say, fascist! Everything that anyone did (laughs) was fascist. And when you keep using the phrase far right to describe completely mainstream views (laughs) that are shared by two-thirds of the population, then you give a free pass to people who genuinely are far right, of whom there are very few in this country, luckily, but there are some. And this constant undermining of the language and over-egging of ways of insulting people in order to shut them up. Look, it's completely clear to me that while there is a huge amount of tolerance in this country for immigration in the round, the pace and particularly the illegality of what we've been seeing Mm. in recent years. I grew up in a part of London that was massively diverse. Brent, it was was the most diverse place in the UK at the time when I was growing up there. And so I grew up with many Indian, Caribbean, Jewish, Irish families in and out of each other's houses all the time. Great friends of mine to this day. And I know from talking to a lot of my childhood friends and indeed their parents who are still knocking around, how they struggled and made sure that they dotted all the I's, crossed all the T's in order 
to get their family to the UK. And when a relative was allowed in, there was, there was literally a street party because everybody knew that that family would then be more complete. Yeah. This is what really gets on the wick of a lot of ordinary British people of immigrant stock. The fact that the small boats are illegal and we can have a long discussion about asylum and the extent to which Britain grants asylum and the extent to which it doesn't. That's a legitimate debate. But I think while people are coming in illegally, you simply can't allow that to happen at the scale it is happening. Because in the end, it will undermine the entire case for immigration and tolerance. Nigel Farage. This is the most commonest thing done by any government in my lifetime in this country. Lionel Shriver. Which is worse, Biden's not being in control and Biden being in control. <laughs> Charles Moore. I think if people in general feel that their traditions, culture, history, values, etc., are under assault, they are basically right. My name is Stephen Edgington, and if you're enjoying this podcast, you might like Off Script, a new series from The Telegraph. Provocative conversations with provocative individuals. Each episode, I sit down with a world leading commentator to unpick the ongoing culture wars. Unfiltered, unscripted, and full of free speech. Be sure to listen to Offscript in the same place you're listening to this, and make sure to follow so you don't miss an episode. While we're thinking about wrong turns that our country has taken co-pilot, personally, I look back to the criminal and cowardly abolition of the grammar schools. For just over two decades in the 50s and 60s, the grammars offered a fantastic free education to academically able children whose families could never have afforded private education. Among those lucky kids were my own mother and father, who both attended the uh, Llanelli Grammar School, which had various distinguished alumni, including Michael Howard, became the Tory leader. Now, the great journalist Peter Hitchens has just written what I think is the definitive book on the rise and fall of grammar schools, A Revolution Betrayed, How Egalitarians Wrecked the British Education System. Peter Hitchens, as listeners will, I'm sure, know, is one of our most distinguished, nay, legendary right-leaning commentators. Not far right, just right, ma mainly right. I'm sure he'd say, I'm just right. A journalist for almost 50 years, Peter has reported from 57 countries and published many excellent books, including The abolition of Britain and the rage against God. As a student, Peter was a revolutionary Marxist and in his 72nd year, he remains a firebrand, although of a more reactionary kind. Describing himself now as a socially conservative social democrat, Peter writes a hugely entertaining, blazingly contrarian weekly column in the Mail on Sunday. For a while, back at the start of the COVID pandemic, Peter was literally the only journalist prepared to stick his neck out and say lockdown was bound to be a disaster. We joined him quite soon thereafter, co-pilot. Peter Hitchens is often a lonely voice, but a hugely powerful one. I began by reminding Peter Hitchens about Tony Crossland's famous boast that he wanted to close down every effing grammar school in the country. And I asked him, why was there Labour hatred for these schools that had brought such opportunity to working class children? And why indeed did grammar schools have so few defenders across the political spectrum? I think a lot of the loathing for grammar schools and other senior Labour politicians came from the realisation very early on in the 64 to 70 Labour government, that they couldn't actually do anything about the private schools, which they really hated above all things. And therefore, this was another target. It was a, a highly political thing. The, the comprehensive schools were not introduced because someone had discovered they were educationally better. They were introduced as a way of trying to make the country more equal. And there was a lot of force behind that, actually, completely mistaken belief, too. It took hold among, particularly among communists, communist teachers' leaders such as Max Morris, it was very strongly felt among the, the, the far left, who were very well established in the education industry, particularly in the education unions, but also in, in the case of Brian Simon, uh, a powerful academic voice on this subject. And there were a lot of people who felt on the left, many of them had had grammar school educations, that in some way it was a sort of class betrayal 
for them to have had to do that, and that they disapproved of the way that it lifted people out of their backgrounds. So that was part of the passion against it, the belief that somehow or other it was an anti-working class thing, which it, it is not true. And there was a lot of idealism about it after the war, people who genuinely believed, Robin Pedley being a particularly good example, that the, the sunlit uplands of education beckoned that if you had common schools in every town, then everybody would go to school together and we would be a much happier and more democratic country. It was idealism, it was utopianism. Instead of sensible hard graphs, brick by brick, a proper social democratic improvement in which people's lives were made better in, in small pieces, it was an enormous sweeping change in which a whole new world was going to be created in which everything was going to be perfect. And then it wasn't. But by the time they discovered how bad it was going to be, as so many people do when they make mistakes, uh, they had not the nerve or the courage to admit that they made a mistake, and they never have. As you make clear in the book, getting a superior education by academic selection at the age of 11 has now been replaced by buying a superior education by moving into the costly catchment area of a good comprehensive, or indeed by paying tutors extortionate sums to get middle-class children into one of the remaining grammar schools. Is the irony that we've ended up with an education system that's less fair now than in the era of the grammar schools, which were damned for being cruel and unfair? I don't think there's any doubt of it. I don't myself favour the 11 plus. I think the German system of selection on merit of assessment, people have a far better chance if they come from, from poor backgrounds of getting a good education and not having their lives wasted. And that's their advantage. And the country has a far better chance of using to the full its talent if you have selection by ability. Now we have this rigid, brutal selection. Every year, National Offer Day, a far more horrible process than the 11 plus ever was, in which you're simply told, because your parents haven't got any money, that your choice of schools is limited to a certain number of not very good comprehensives, and that's what you're stuck with. It's very heavily, very heavily affected by money and by house price, and there's, there's no doubt about it. Organizations such as the Sutton Trust, which have no time for grammar schools, and Teach First as well, have done the research on this, and the, the, the social bias in the better comprehensives. I won't call them good because none of them are remotely as good as grammar schools used to be. But the, the, the social selection in those schools is terrifying and ruthless. And the other thing about it is there's no going back over it. Unless your parents win the lottery, you're not going to move into a better catchment area during your entire education. At least with the old, the old selection viability arrangement, you actually got, a, in many cases, a second chance at 13. Something I wasn't aware of, Peter, which you write about in the book, that there was this post-war baby bulge, and that did make it far harder to get into grammar schools in around 1956 because there were simply more children competing for that same number of places because they hadn't rapidly expanded the number of grammar schools. I think there were about 1,300, or certainly there were 1,300. At the end, there were almost 1,300. Well, you can blame it on the baby bulge, but I have to blame it on the Conservative government. Uh, which had known ever since it came to office that there was going to be this pressure because it had gone through all the primary schools, huge uh, wave of increased uh, of increased pressure on on school classrooms, and they'd known all the time that there was going to be a, a need for many more grammar school places, and they did not absolutely nothing, but almost nothing to fix it. So when it finally hit, totally predictably in 1956, it's, it's like being told there will be a tsunami five years' time on this coast, and everybody sits there doing nothing about it, and they did almost nothing about it. So when that came, of course, the system, which had never been totally fair, uh, became deeply unfair in some places, and people were excluded from chances at grammar school who should have gone. And this began to make the idea of selection by those unpopular. And it, uh, until then, this had been an obsession with the Labour left, particularly the Labour educational left. And it hadn't really meshed with public opinion. But after then, it, it did and became an election issue of sorts, particularly in 64. But it wasn't the schools that were unpopular, it was the exam. And it, the, the Labour government came into office in 64 on a manifesto that more or less said, we will provide grammar school education for everyone, which is a flat lie. Your book really touched a nerve with me, Peter. We've spoken about this before 
Both my parents from working class families in South Wales went to grammar school, huge agent of change in their lives. My mother left school at 16, but her excellent grammar school education made her a lot more numerate and literate than many kids coming out of university these days. So I was unfortunately part of the first generation to enter a fully comprehensive system at my school. There were some leftover grammar school teachers, but many of them were not cut out for the hurly-burly of mixed ability teaching, to say the least. I remember one English master who had been locked in a cupboard by my charming peers. Now, as you say, Peter, the promise was that in the comprehensive system, Every child would get a grammar school education, not a secondary modern education. What actually happened? Well, it varied. Some of the new comprehensives were, to begin with, uh, extremely successful because they were run by headmasters and teachers who had grammar school experience and continued, even with uh, honours boards and mortar boards and gowns and all the, the trappings of an old fashioned education. But the pressure was still on. The radicals, once they got the comprehensives campaign for mixed ability teaching as well, and they, in many cases, got it. The mergers worked as long as there were charismatic, uh, brilliant, old-fashioned teachers around to make them work. And as they faded away, the rigor in the schools faded away. And one of the things that, that showed this very quickly, in fact, was that uh, very soon after the big new comprehensives were, were created in several big cities, the news started to come in that the results of GCE O-level were very bad, and they were bad in comparison with both grammar schools, and this is interesting, both grammar schools and secondary moderns, so the undiscussed side of this, which the book goes into a lot. And it was quite clear that, that something had to be done, and what was done was that the GCE O-level was at first watered down and regraded as to make it less rigorous. And then eventually, once that had gone on for enough years, it was replaced by the far less rigorous and in fact totally different GCSE, which is a comprehensive examination. And what happened was that the grammar schools, not wholly gone, but largely gone, the whole of the education system went through enormous inflation. There was also Zimbabwe, and so people were being awarded as the left wing all comes to say, well, they all get lots of certificates, and indeed they do, but they are Zimbabwe dollars. They're not worth anything like what they used to be. So basically you think that the O-level couldn't survive the destruction of the grammar schools and hence has resulted in this momentous grade inflation that doesn't line up, as you say, with any genuine improvements in education? Well, it had to. Nobody ever did, at the time of the change, direct comparative research between comprehensive schools and grammar schools. It was never done, and we're left without it. So we have to work with what we've got. And the single most significant measure, and that's why I use it so much in the book, is what happened to the examination system. And that is what happened. That there, are, there were reports, uh, you, you see them in some of the conservative papers in, I think, 65, 66, that schools in areas where comprehensive reorganization had taken place uh, in the same city where, for instance, the Roman Catholic schools had not gone comprehensive, the, the results in the GCE O levels in those comprehensive, new comprehensive schools were significantly worse than they were in the uncomprehensivized Roman Catholic schools. It seems to me to be about as close as you will ever get to a direct comparison. And what happened next, and I, there was a chapter called From O-Level to, to No-Level in which I described the process of the devaluation of the O-Level. What happens next seems to confirm this, and everybody, I think, will recognize who has any memory at all that the A-Level has gone down the same path, and of course degrees have too. Can I ask you, is it now a lost cause? Do you think any of the academies with their kind of strict standards of behavior, emphasis on academic achievement and, and good conduct, have they replaced it in any satisfactory way? And what would you say is the loss to our country of getting rid of the grammar schools? I like and admire Catherine Burgle saying it, and I've been several times to her school, but I don't think it even begins to approximate to what the grammar schools used to be, which was a lighthouse of, of rigorously taught proper knowledge in the, the sciences and literature and the arts and history, the canon of education as it was. Education is a conservative activity. It is the passing on of, of what society has valued over the centuries with the aid of authority to the young. And it can't be done unless you believe in that. And comprehensive education does not believe in that. It believes in facilitating children and in guiding them. It doesn't believe in authority. And it doesn't generally believe in the canon. 
So however good you make your comprehensive school, it's still working with a curriculum and examination system, which actually doesn't really engender the sort of education we used to have. The, the loss is, is gigantic. It's, it's a twofold loss of I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of young men and women, probably many now coming into middle age, who will never, ever, ever actually exercise their talents to the full of their lives because they were thrown into terrible, chaotic schools where they weren't allowed to learn and where learning was despised by their fellow pupils and there wasn't enough order for it to take place. And the loss to the country, which seems to me to be quite plain, uh, in every area, from the sciences to the arts and also to the leadership of the country. We simply do not have an educated elite anymore of people capable of examining propaganda and saying this is propaganda rather than truth. And I think that was demonstrated quite convincingly uh, during the COVID panic when there really wasn't any a serious force of people in this country, there were individuals, there wasn't a serious force of people in this country capable of standing up to what I regard as something very close to mass hysteria. I wanted to ask your view quickly on the present government. Is Rishi Sunak a Conservative Prime Minister leading a Conservative government? And would we actually be better off with a Blair government? You would be better off, but I don't think you'd be much worse off either. That's the trouble. Many years ago now, it is around about 2010, in the years before David Cameron became Prime Minister, I campaigned to try and explain to people that what the Blairites were doing at that stage was trying to take over the Conservative Party and turn it into an image of themselves. And that if the electorate endorsed this in 2010, which they did, then they would endorse the Blairite takeover of the Conservative Party. Now, people sometimes say, oh, so you say the Tories are left-wing. I say, no, the Tories aren't left-wing because they're too stupid to realise what it is they're doing. They really don't. They have no clue what's going on. And, of course, the willingness of people to, to keep them in office on the grounds that they're a Conservative Party is one of their main strengths. I don't, I, so I don't think you'd be particularly worse off if you had Keir Starmer. Though it, it, Keir Starmer would be, and this is the problem with being a former Marxist, uh, I know this, he would be the first Pabloite Prime Minister that this country has ever had. And most people don't even know what a Pabloite is. No, I don't know. Tell me. Pablo himself was a, was a sort of soldier of fortune on the far left who, who ran guns to Algeria during the war with the French. And, and in his later years, he said that... that Revolutionary socialism should take a completely new form, uh, the red and the green. And the red was sexual, social and cultural revolution, was the green program, which we all now have to live under. And this should be the main the main purpose of the left. And this has happened. And people don't understand the Greens are much more ferocious to left wing than social democrats because of the green, uh, the whole green frontage of it. But we're going to have a very left wing prime minister if Sakia actually reaches down the street. Finally, Peter, I want to ask you about COVID and lockdown. You were one of the very first people to raise the alarm about lockdown. There were very few journalists throughout who dared to query this unprecedented closing down of basic freedoms. I know you're a a veteran of current affairs. I think we were at a dinner once and (laughs) you leant across the table and you said, Alison, your problem is you still believe in things, by which I was duly chastised. But were even you, Peter, shocked by the speed with which this unprecedented assault on our civil liberties was allowed to unfold? Not shocked, no. Alarmed, but not shocked. I had seen in several earlier occasions, from September the 11th to the frenzy over the death of Princess Diana, signs of a very ready descent into hysteria in British politics, public and media. And I had not, I have to say, expected the, the worst instance of it so far known to be over a, a virus. But when it came, uh, as I wasn't surprised to see it come, just the, the form in which it came was surprised, but very dismayed because the acceptance by people in such a short time of the removal of their freedoms on such a scale, and also of political and economic actions, which were obviously loopy in the extreme, and were going to do inevitably enormous damage to people's livelihoods and jobs and to the economy in general, without any serious criticism going on. I just thought, what can be going on? And you say I was almost alone. My impression was in the first few days that I was totally alone. Uh, Other people did, to my great delight, join in very soon after. But at the beginning, that was it. And I thought, well, what am I going to do about this? And what I was going to do about it was, and thank heaven I had an editor who believed very strongly that uh, dissenting views 
had to be expressed and had to be had to be given the, the platform of the newspaper, and I got that. So I, I rejoice in that, and I like to think that if, thanks to that, it may be that the thing wasn't quite as bad you know, as it would otherwise have been. And other people seeing what I was doing were able to join in, but I, it was extremely lonely, as it often is, perplexing, but not surprising. On Planet Normal, Peter, we have a lot of listeners from all walks of life in health, business, education, science, the armed forces. Uh, listeners are all excellent, notably sane, bright people who can see what the problems are in their various fields, but who are often battling forces from health and safety, various woke absurdities, repression of free speech, failure of politicians of any party to stick up for their values. Do you have any encouraging words for the citizens of Planet Normal, Peter? Can we live in hope that Planet Normal may triumph on planet Earth? I, I sometimes feel I should set up an advice bureau, which would issue this is advice. Like, <laughs> actually, it's all over. Stop pretending that there's anything to be hopeful here. Yeah. Make your own private arrangements. We've had it. But my view is that this is a country in which the revolution has happened. We live in a society who have no idea that we've already been decapitated by one of the most enormous political, social, cultural, and social revolutions in history. The political power, economic power, educational power, media power all lies with the enemy and what is more the, the, the victims of this revolution for the most part don't even realize that it's happened it's the Kierkegaardian revolution all the buildings are still standing and in many cases they look rather nice but the things they represent have vanished and people are, are, are moving around in a world which is completely altered and they, they, every so often they come up against it and they say oh good heavens my child is being propagandized at school, or, oh, good heavens, I'm now paying more tax than any time since the 1940s. Or mass immigration seems to be a popular concern of every government since 1997, and it doesn't seem to stop. And there's some examples of things which are going on and have happened when nobody was looking. And how do you propose to reverse that? If people couldn't even see that the arrival of David Cameron as the leader of the Conservative Party was a disaster for the country, and couldn't even see that, that, that voting for him would confirm the, the takeover of the last Conservative political party in the country by the left. And what do you propose to do now? Uh, if you have any bright ideas, send them to me on, on, a, on a postcard. I'd love to know. But it, I look at it and I think, kindly nod, please. <laughs> Peter, you're a perfect guest for Planet Normal, despite the gloom. Everybody will be hugely cheered up by the Eeyore-ish blast. Thank you so much for being a guest on Planet Normal today. Well, it's being so pessimistic, this keeps me cheerful. <laughs> it's interesting, Alison, there are about 160 grammar schools still, aren't there? Mm -hmm. Around 5% of pupils go to grammar schools, but they do tend to be these days kids from relatively affluent families who can afford the tutoring, can afford the parental time and effort that goes into passing that 11 plus, a tough exam. Yes, Peter Hitchens has, among many very funny turns of phrase in the book, he describes the alpha mummies competing and training up the uh, training up the middle class children to get into. Of course, they do give a fantastic education, Liam, don't they? So you're saving yourself thousands and thousands of pounds a year. Let me just remind listeners that Peter Hitchens' book, A Revolution Betrayed, How Egalitarians Wrecked the British Education System, is published by Bloomsbury Continuum. And you can buy a copy on Amazon, although, as Peter would say, not available in all good bookshops because being considered rather right-wing, unbelievably, Liam, bookshops don't always want to stock Peter's book. I think you probably tell, I feel it very personally, I feel very keenly the loss of grammar schools for working-class children as my parents were. I do think they were great. They only lasted for 21 years, but I think they gave our country an extraordinary generation of talented, particularly scientists and medics. And there were lawyers coming up to Oxford and Cambridge from the valleys where I come from. And it's a key stat for me, Liam, is that now Oxbridge tries to sort of gerrymander places for kids from our kind of homes. But when the grammars were thriving, there was no need for any special favours because those kids were so well educated, they could beat the pants off the privately educated kids, which I just think we are missing a trick. Other countries have no embarrassment about schooling an elite to enrich their society. And I think it's a great shame that things have been dumbed down. 
I think that's right. My mum's one of 10 kids and they pretty much all went to grammar school, very bright working class people. But she's the only one who actually stayed on after 14 because she was the youngest and the others had to leave at 14 to make money for the family. And that was not so long ago. It does strike me as strange that the grammars were allowed to wilt on the vine. And of course, Margaret Thatcher closed more grammars or oversaw the closing of more grammars even than Shirley Williams. So it does seem to me that the establishment quite liked the fact that the grammars were closed because it meant there was less competition from the masses, perhaps. A longer version of that splendidly Eeyore-ish interview with Peter Hitchens is available to Telegraph subscribers and you can find the details in the show notes. I highly recommend it. His views on the non-conservative conservatives are particularly enjoyable. Now it's time for our listener emails. Your message is sent to planetnormal at telegraph.co.uk. Please do keep them coming. This is from Lynn, responding promptly to the Sturgeon news. Dear Alison and Liam, three hearty cheers. Nicola Sturgeon has resigned. We have suffered enough. It was actually my intention to email this week with some especially wonky wokery from Scotland. Here is some of the rubbish we've been left with during Nicola's reign. Whilst trying to calculate the taxes due on our parents' old house and buying a share of the house from my siblings, I came up against this piece of nonsense on the government website, Revenue Scotland. Worked tax examples from Revenue Scotland. Replace people's names with colours. The result is a clumsy, opaque government information site. I was reminded of your powerful reflections, Alison, on Georgia Maloney, Italy's Prime Minister. We are not code numbers or colours. We'll defend our identity. Opaque information sites and mail period information officers are just some of the woke rubbish our taxes are squandered on in Scotland. Nicola Sturgeon talked in yesterday's resignation announcement of the challenge of going for a walk or coffee with a friend as First Minister. My response, First Minister, you kept us locked in our homes and under some of the country's most stringent lockdown rules. You have squandered our hard-earned taxes. You've done enough damage. Three cheers and hurrah, you're leaving. Keep up the excellent work, co-pilots. Planet normal. The week is never the same without you guys in it. Warmest regards, Lynn. This is from Trevor. One former civil servant on Newsnight referred to colleagues being left with PTSD, that's post-traumatic stress disorder, after encounters with Dominic Raab, (laughs) who is, of course, the Justice Secretary. Seriously? Like being in Afghanistan and having your legs blown off? Are these people real or are they just self-important wimps, asked Trevor. And this is from Hugh. Tony Blair stacked the civil service with left-wing sympathisers, he writes. Cameron was too weak to reverse that. And we're now in a position where right-wing policies from an elected government are being actively blocked, says Hugh, by the unelected left-wing civil service. And this is from Donald. I was introduced today to the term fashionable irrational belief, FIB. Is this not just the most wonderful way of puncturing the pretensions of leftists? It describes their whole ideology fashionable, irrational beliefs, FIBs, it's all fibs. Fantastic. Maria says, it's a bewildering and increasingly alien world we live in. Such illogicality among the so-called thinking classes, not to mention sheep mentality, all jumping on the bandwagon of fashionable thinking. It's like a new religion with upside down values and endless preaching from a position of infuriating moral superiority. It's harmful to so many, and I honestly think a silent majority of people are alienated but too fearful to speak up for fear of provoking this awful, righteous mob. And this is from Robert. It's not the left that has moved further left, says Robert. Rather, it is the right and the centre that have moved left. There is no centre-right party anymore. And finally, Liam, you'll like this. This is from Duke. It's a quote from Duke. Tolerance will reach such a level that intelligent people will be banned from thinking so as not to offend the imbeciles. Duke says this is incorrectly attributed to Dostoevsky, that marvellous quote. Says it's very appropriate today. If anyone knows who said 
tolerance will reach such a level that intelligent people will be banned from thinking so as not to offend the imbeciles. Please write in and let us know. This is from Mary. It's been a liberal strategy for the past 50 years, she writes. Whenever white working class people raise legitimate concerns about how immigration is affecting their communities, they're immediately denigrated as racists and victims of right wing manipulation. One effect of this was seen in Rochdale and 24 other towns and cities where gangs of mainly Pakistani men were allowed to rape and pimp children for two decades unchallenged for fear of upsetting community relations. Liberals have no response to this other than to express their hatred for those who are harmed by it and to delegitimize their concerns. We see the result of that approach in Europe with the rise of far-right groups prepared to challenge such denialism. A powerful email there from Mary. And on that bombshell, that's it from Planet Normal for another week. As we leave our sanctuary of sweet reason, our flying refuge of reason views and no UFOs, email of the week. Liam, your turn. I think we should give email of the week to Donald for his fashionable, irrational <laughs> beliefs. So, Donald, email us, planetnormal at telegraph.co.uk. Put mug winner in the subject heading to your email and give us your postal address and we'll send you that coveted Planet Normal mug. I think Fib's fashionable, irrational beliefs can enter the planet normal pantheon, mythological with orthogonal to the orthodoxy. <laughs> if you enjoy Planet Normal, please leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. They really cheer me and the co-pilot up. And as we speed away from our beloved Planet Normal and the madness of Planet Earth comes back into view, thanks as ever to our producers, Isabel Bajard, A. Lampitt, and our editor, Zoe Hitch. Stay safe and in touch with us and with each other. Until next week, it's goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from him. <laughs>